Are you ready to learn? Because my super experienced guests are ready to share some really valuable information. Make sure and listen all the way to the end to get help and support. So let's start with the best audio experience. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our show. Today we discuss about customers, how you can connect with your customers, because according to uh, many studies online, that uh, retaining customers uh, costs five times less than uh, acquiring new ones. But I think we can pay attention to any different channels, you know, to retain, to find new ones. And I'm excited to discuss this topic with Claude Thomas. How are you? Hello, I'm good. Thank you for inviting me on. And I loved that video intro. It made me realize how much grayer I am now <laughs> than when we did those photo shoots. Time to do some more photos, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I have a team in Ukraine, uh, great video designers, and they, uh, yeah, uh, I don't limit them with some requirements. Please uh, don't do this, just uh, use exact uh, pictures, uh, video style. You know, uh, they have freedom with that. They can uh, create anything, so they just take your uh, account experience, uh, your website, trying to find your pictures, your experience, and yeah, and create such designs. Yeah, cool. Love it. They've done a great job. <laughs> nice. Okay, I will tell them. Uh, <laughs> before we start, just tell more about the experience, background, and why you decided to pay a lot of attention with uh, about uh, searching for uh, how to get customers, how to retain them, and uh, similar topics. Cool. Well, I've been in um, marketing and e-commerce for almost 20 years now. Started off working for a multi-channel retailer in the UK, running their catalogue mailings and their online marketing and a little bit of work for the stores as well. And then uh, ran a marketing agency for 10 years where we were all about building connection with customers and finding new customers via various channels. And um, since I sold that, about five years ago, I am now all about helping e-commerce marketers and e-commerce business owners solve their marketing problems. And um, this year, I suppose the biggest marketing opportunity, which deals with a lot of the marketing problems we've got at the moment, is building a stronger connection with your customers, whether that's through personalization or automation or better segmentation, or whether it's about getting the right messaging, the right creative and the right marketing messages, values, missions, etc. out there. That's what I'm trying to help people with at the moment. So that's, mm -hmm. does that answer your question, Anna Zoli? Of course, a hundred percent. It's hard to reply to, uh, you know, to provide all insights for a short answer, but yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay. Uh, uh, let's talk more about customers, how to connect mm -hmm. with them. Uh, for example, I, I have uh, some, um, loyal customers who, uh, and I help them for a few years. Uh, I usually uh, search for new customers because I want to increase, um, uh, you know, my sales. Can you tell uh, for a new project, for example, if uh, companies want to launch new project, high quality uh, products, uh, what to do first uh how to find first customers uh and uh, yeah and uh, if you can provide some checklist with that yeah sure so it's it's always that balancing act between your new customer acquisition and your existing customer marketing what what do you do where do you spend your effort where do you spend your budget and i think what it's one of those big questions for this year in particular because we're seeing huge you know competition um uh, levels on uh online and with offline as well and we're also seeing big levels of competition in sorry big increases in consumers desire for connection and we're also seeing the squeeze on consumer spending ability as inflation rates go up, which, of course, is also increasing your cost. It's like an awful time to be trying to grow a, growing a brand, which means we need to get the basics right. And we need to create the best opportunity to bind our customers to ourselves. So I suppose, um, and sorry, would you prefer me to tackle the customer acquisition bit or the customer attention bit first? And I'll try and give some tick lists and checklists for everybody. Well, let's talk about acquisition. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's okay. Awesome let, let's because... talk more about acquisition and yeah, okay. Because acquisition is where retention begins as well. So the better quality customers you get into your business, the better quality 
all your marketing and everything else and the success of your business becomes if you get the right people in and not the wrong people in. And for me at the moment, if I was building a customer acquisition plan, I would actually be starting with, with what's the message we should be putting out there? What problems are our products solving for people? What is the why behind why they're choosing our products ahead of someone else's? You've kind of got to get get to that emotional level, that empathy level, that um, that why level, basically, if you want your marketing to cut through all the noise out there and to get and to attract the right people in. So I'd start with what are our key messages, which is very closely aligned with who is the core customer we want to go after. A few weeks ago, we put a podcast episode live where I'm talking with the marketing director of Grove Collaborative, which is a US business which sell um, uh, cleaning products with refills, basically. It's homewares products with a sustainability angle. And we were talking about how with that business, they've grown it to 2 million customers, focusing in almost exclusively on consumers who know they want to do sustain, sustainable practices in their home lives. So they're going for these people and they've got really in depth on these people and how they, the questions they've got as they're buying the product, what's appealing to them about the product and the Grove Collaborative solution. And then they tailor those marketing method, messages to it. And unless you can get yourself really in the mindset of that target customer and the niche the, or the niche that you're going after, you're going to really struggle with any of the rest of the marketing activity. So that's the first thing I would do is speak to some customers, get my head around it. Once I've done that, then I'd create the Facebook ads, the TikTok ads, whichever gets you in front of the right people and really work on getting the creative, the messaging, the copy right on those because that's going to be core to it. Then back on your website, I'd make sure you've got the right messages in the right places and... And this is the probably the most difficult bit out of the whole of it is I would build a quiz to correct, 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 collect the zero party data from those people you're paying to get to your website. Because if you've got that quiz in place that's asking them and taking them through a journey of what of your products they want, then not only are you um, giving, taking them, ca capturing their data. Right. So then you can continue marketing to them afterwards. You are also personalizing the buyer journey to them. And when you do that, they just become more likely to buy. So it's a win on both fronts. Complicated to get set up, complicated to do right. There's going to be a lot of testing, a lot of trialing. Start with one question, see what happens, then build up to two questions and build the right flows out the back of it. But those are kind of the key things I do. So get, really hone your marketing message to the right, to the right piece. Then get your ads in line with that marketing message. Then get your homepage right. Then build your quizzes and your automations. Then really focus in on that. Um, so that's what I do in customer acquisition this year. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Uh, love your insights. Okay, uh, let's talk more about content marketing. You know, uh, for example, um, a few studies share that uh, you need to, uh, customers need to meet your brand seven times before buying your products. Uh, how it's important today? Because uh, I often see some businesses pay attention to sell uh, without trying to share value first. Uh, is it a good idea or it's better uh, to... Uh, to, to have the balance, you know, to create brand awareness, to, uh, to share value, uh, I don't know, like to create educational content or free gifts or anything else before selling. Can you tell more about that? I think you're completely right. We need to... as. <sighs> We need to be putting content out there that people feel a connection to. It, so it's a trend that was growing pre-pandemic. It's a trend that's only accelerated post-pandemic. We want as consumers to feel a connection to the brands we're buying from. And that comes from not being told, get this water bottle 20% off. Get this water bottle 20% off. What about this water bottle now 30% off? You know, that's not what's going to get us to buy. What might get us to buy is here's a lovely water bottle. It comes in blue. And did you know that the seals are replaceable and that you can throw it around and it doesn't leak? You know, <laughs> what are the whys behind why your customers want to buy a water bottle? And to talk about that, to understand, you know, are they big hikers? Should you be putting out, you know, here's some great hiking routes. Here's a guide to the best hiking equipment. Here are the water bottles that are best for hiking. You know, it, 
we need to get beyond just here's a product, here's a product, here's a product and find those those avenues that relate to the customer. Water bottles is a terrible example. It's a hard one to do it for. But if you're selling, I know, dog food and dog products, it becomes a lot easier to understand because you can ask simple, you know, you, you can put out, understand who your existing customers, what sort of dogs they tend to have, small dogs, big dogs, pedigree dogs, um, old dogs, young dogs, then create content about that, put that out in your social channels, um, on your blogs, in YouTube, et cetera, on your product pages even, you know, because they are a form of content marketing and talk to that on the issues and the opportunities that those dogs have, then you, you know, in their life cycle, et cetera, then you, you, you are going to start building a better connection because what you want and what you're doing with all of this content marketing is you're hoping that the point where that person goes, my dog's looking a little bit unhappy. Maybe he needs better food. You're the brand they already know, like, and trust because you've been putting this great, useful, educational, resonating content in front of them. Or I need a new water bottle to take hiking. I remember this is the brand that helped me find the right shoes or the right path for me, or they helped me persuade my partner to get into hiking as well. So it's it's building a building a connection, building something they want to talk about to their friends about you. And it is infinite, the the opportunities, <laughs> and it exists, you know, even for as dull a product as a water bottle, it exists. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be as interesting a product as a dog. Yeah, uh, I, can't, I can't avoid one question, you know, because, uh, sorry for that, but I can see nice books uh, on your background. <laughs> can you tell more about your life in books? Why Why do you read them? Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, because you know, uh, I love reading books as well. Uh, once I decided to quit watching TV and uh, uh, and I found that wow. it's better to replace <laughs> uh, watching TV with reading books. So yeah, I, um, and uh, yeah, after that, I can feel much happier. You know, can you tell? Uh, and oh. I see one book, uh, e-commerce marketing. So Provide more insights about that. This one's my book. Um, that one takes mm. us. So that's e-commerce marketing: how to get traffic that buys to your website. Came out uh, about two years ago, being a bestseller in the UK and the US. And it is, it's the book you nice. need if you're trying to work out how to approach. The, the marketing channels to get the most out of them. So in it, I take you through the key marketing channels in e-commerce, everything from partnerships and influencers through to Facebook ads. It's not click here, do this. It's more, will this work for you? Will it not? What do you need to know? So if you want to hire someone to do it, it's a good book to read for that. And then we go through some of, kind of the, the more broad marketing pieces like the neuroscience and key messages, planning, all this kind of stuff in there. So that's that one. And then the rest are a mixture of e-commerce marketing and um, sustainability books are creeping in these days. Um, do you want me to pick a couple that I'm particularly excited by at the moment? Would that be good? Or mm -hmm. yes, no? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I think it's better to read all of them. <laughs> 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 then I can review. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, let's see. What else have we got? We've got this one isn't even on the shelf yet. This one uh -huh. came out this week. An mm -hmm. amazing book by Mike Stevens, who's pretty amazing in e-commerce and D2C in his own right. So that one is my hot tip at the moment. It's literally fresh off the presses. And it goes mm -hmm. through the case studies of 16 different D2C brands and how they've done what they've done and the problems they've had and so forth. Everyone should be reading this book. Um, nice. We've also got, this is another one I talk about a lot, The New Chameleons by Michael R. Solomon, How to Connect mm -hmm. with Consumers Who Defy Categorization, which is all about how, it's very much about what we were talking about a few minutes ago around identifying why customers are buying and understanding them better. So that one, big fan of that one as well. Uh, we've got another couple of my books. So we've got Customer Persuasion. Um, actually, here you go. Customer Persuasion, mm -hmm. How to Influence Your Customers to Buy More. That's really about the buying journey and optimizing every stage of it from website to marketing and other things. Uh, we've got, oh, so you're, I'm going to end up pulling apart my bookcase now, Anatoly. I'm not gonna yeah, okay, back okay. In. This one, mm -hmm. everyone should have this one. It's the quick guide to working out 
whether a banana or an avocado is the bad decision or whether you should be watching mm -hmm. an hour of telly or listening to a podcast for an hour because it's the carbon calculations of all of that, which is very good. Um, mm -hmm. Another sustainability one, what we need mm -hmm. to do now for a zero carbon future. Surprisingly optimistic book. So if you're feeling nice. a bit down about the planet, that's a good one to read. Um, we've got another of mine. This one's about B2B e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So that's if you're trying to sell to other businesses via e-commerce, that's the one for you. Um, the next one is by uh, some friends of mine. And if you if you find my book, e-commerce marketing on Amazon, you will inevitably see that people are buying it alongside this one, which is written mm -hmm. by the brilliant Hammersley Brothers. And they break down e-commerce growth into a number of key KPIs. I think seven of them. Um, mm -hmm. and how to go about doing it. It's quite a thin one, this one. Love it. It's a great Love book. It. Is this good? Shall I keep going? Oh, yeah. L l let's get back to the main topic. Okay. I think, yeah, <laughs> you have a nice library. <laughs> uh, if yeah. anyone wants wants the full list, let me, let me know and I'll write it out for yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, guys, just connect with uh, on LinkedIn. I'll submit all uh, links in the description below. Yeah, because it's more audio format uh, for... Uh, Apple, Spotify, Google. Yeah, but we have people who are watching online. So yeah, it's better to add all these books in the description. We can do it, by the way. <laughs> and okay, I, I have the next question uh, about um, selling to everyone. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, I found that many companies uh, are struggling to find a buying persona because uh, they can sell to female, male, different ages, uh, but it's not... Uh, good idea to sell everyone and uh, how to find a buying persona for companies uh, if uh, all their previous sales from different people categories uh, i don't know uh, yeah what do you think about that i have um kind of like a love hate relationship with personas because mm -hmm. i think um, a lot of people get hung up on the we must pick an age range we must pick a gender and so forth um, so I, I think to, to try and create kind of an old school segmentation category is wrong. Hence, um, why I like My Michael Solomon's, um, book, the new chameleon mm -hmm. so much, cause it re it talks to this scenario, which is that we are different people in different statuses of our lives. We may be the, um, the consumer who buys all their leisure clothing brand new but we buy our gym, gym clothing secondhand and we rent our work wardrobe. Mm -hmm. So we're quite, we, these days we tend to be quite weird. We don't really fit into simple boxes. So I think when it, when it comes to personas, I think you need an idea of who your customer is, but I think it's more about their motivations, why they buy, why your product is useful to them, how they use it is far more important less useful mm -hmm. in a data selection standpoint but that's far more useful the messaging than the box and i i say this from out there knowing as as a, a direct response marketer at heart okay my career started in direct mail buying cold lists and sending out catalogs you know mm -hmm. i love a bit of really zeroing down on it but i don't think that serves you that well anymore i think what we need to be doing these days is we need to be getting more into that empathy, that why, that messaging standpoint, rather than going, she's 18 to 24 and she likes the color blue and she also shops in these th three stores. But saying that, that data is still very useful for putting together a marketing um, strategy. So I would still be asking questions like that of my existing customer base because it's mm -hmm. going to be useful for targeting, but it's not as crucial as we've we thought in the past. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, I have the question about uh, impatience. You know, most customers are impatient to get uh, replies immediately. Uh, they wanna uh, get uh, awesome uh, customer support and uh, many websites, platforms, you know, they can't reply immediately. It's frustrated, you know, for example, when I submit a request, I can wait for a few days just to <laughs> get some simple answer. I understand they have huge audience, big audience, it's hard to reply. Can you tell more about automation? How we can um, 
use automation tools uh, to reply to those questions, uh, uh, how to set up them, and uh, yeah, to satisfy customers right now. Yeah, it's speed is of the essence in these things. The quicker you get back to someone, the more likely they are to go on and buy. You are to build the trust with them, and and so on and so forth. So I think. For me, the very first thing you need to do is to automate your systems and to make sure you've got the right systems and the right practices in place in your business. If you're finding that the majority of your customers are buying in the evenings, as is often the case in e-commerce, and your customer services team all go home at 5 p.m., you have a problem. And that is the thing you need to fix first is to to either hire another firm to cover it whilst your 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 core team aren't in work or find well, actually fundamentally you need to find some people to cover the core selling period one way or another or you change the shift pattern of your existing team because that's number one is are you there ready to answer the questions when the majority of the customers need to be there i am not suggesting you should be running 24 7 if you're a small business but you need an overflow system or a different shift pattern to cover those key buying periods to make sure you're there that's number one Number two, you need to invest in the software. And there are a plethora of options out there that bring all those questions from all those platforms into one place. Um, you know, we've got gorgeous Zendesk, all these different, there's, there's lots of options out there and they will suck in all the stuff that happens on social media, on email, on the chat on your website, wherever it may be, into one place so you can organize it in that place. And that will save you a lot of time because you can put on your contact us page that you don't respond to social media questions, but your customers don't care. They're going to ask you questions where they want to ask you questions and you need to be there ready to respond. There is nothing worse in this world, more disheartening in this world. Actually, there probably are a few things, but when it comes to being a marketer, when you see someone's Facebook ad with a load of questions under it that haven't been answered, there's nothing that's going to erode trust in your business front and new customers bigger than that. Sorry, I'm starting to rant. So first, <laughs> get your team working at the right times, whether that's a new team or an existing team changes. That's number one. Number two, Get software in place to make your life easier. Now, once you've got that software sucking everything in, you can then create systems that will make sure the right person's answering the right questions. You know, if you've got someone on your team who is brilliant at explaining water bottles to people, to go back to my mm -hmm. awful example, make sure they're getting all the water bottle questions and the shoe questions are going to somebody else. So play to your strengths, make it easy on your team. In such software packages as these, you can also set up uh, copy and paste responses, you know, templates for the for the obvious questions, which is going to speed your team up a lot as well. And then once you've got the hang of all of that, you can start looking at the automated responses. So chatbots and the like. So when something comes in with this question, you automatically go back. I know a lot of people say, let's just chuck the chatbot in straight away. But I think until you really understand the types of questions people are, people are asking, the type of responses, and run it for a while, you're not going to know what to automate. And a lot of time, I have wasted a lot of time in my life. I know a lot of other businesses who have building automations that never got used. So wait and see where you've got lots of time being spent and then build the automations around those areas where you can give that level of service. So that's that's how I'd approach getting back to customers. And what you're trying to do is to get back to everybody fast because customer service is a sales channel when it's done right. Um, it's not a, it shouldn't be a cost area in your business. It should be an area that increases the conversion rate. <laughs> I take it yeah. you like the answer there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't sell these people. They are from North Korea, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> But I, I think they love to, to learn something new as well. Yeah, it's hard to uh, to get this online. Uh, hope they can uh, achieve to libraries, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have the next question about um, uh, keeping customers longer. Uh, how to do it? Uh, for example, uh, you know, I, I want to share uh, my personal experience. In our company, I usually give more than I promised before. For example, if they order my link, link building services, I can uh, provide some uh, writing uh, content for their websites if they uh, are struggling to, uh, to create it. Or, for example, we can uh, design something. Uh, and um, uh, we usually uh, talk 
more with customers. For example, we uh, don't uh, submit uh, reports only one time a month, you know, and yeah, please uh, pay one more time. I usually talk to them, you know, I love to, uh, to cooperate and uh, to uh, know how I can help more. So yeah, it's my experience. Can you provide more insights? How to uh, retain customers longer today? I think under promising and over delivering is a good move in every business. You never want to over promise and under deliver because that's a really quick way to get rid of everybody on your list, quite frankly. Um, I think in e-commerce, the core ways to do it are putting, you know, surprises in the package when it goes out, creating a bit of a wow factor as someone unboxes their their um, their products. Another way that I think a lot of brands are failing at the moment, where I think there's a huge opportunity, is the post-purchase communication sequence, which for a lot of brands is here's the receipt and here's your delivery notification that may come from someone other than your business, uh, which you can now integrate it so you can send that via your own brand as well. But they just leave it at that. It's all very transactional. And actually, Research shows that if someone checks out on your website, they get excited, their heart rate literally goes up and then they've made it and then they're like, oh, I've got to wait. I don't know when it's going to arrive. I'm getting a bit nervous. I'm getting a little bit worried about what's going on here. And, you know, they're they're at that nervy point. And if you can, can reiterate that they've made a good buying decision, maybe you're sending them emails about, you know, the people behind the company, what's happening with their parcel, more information about delivery, which actually this is that's the big cost in customer services that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, the delivery side of things. So the more you can warn them about delivery and, and give them information around that, the less they're going to um, use annoy your sales team with those with those queries. And then also content that's going to make that unboxing experience more powerful. So I ha I bought from a lovely little business called Paper Republic this diary. Okay, so it's. Mm -hmm some notebooks all tied together with little bits of um, bits of elastic. So mm -hmm. during the period between when I bought it and when it arrived, they sent me a video of how to put it together, which I can imagine quite a lot of people getting this and going, I've got some pieces of elastic and I've got a piece of leather and I've got some notebooks and I, I, I'm lost. I've hurt my fingers. You know, so they're making sure that when you unbox it, you know, you're excited, you've got your product and then it, you're like, I don't know what to do when I've got to go and Google and try and find an example. You know, this goes with, you know, whether you're selling a beauty product or dog food or you're selling water, but, you know, how do you fill up your water bottle? I don't know. Um, you know, <laughs> or you're selling tents or something. There's so much you can do to make sure that when they get that product, they are ready, happy to take advantage, to use it, to make that whole piece feel. And yeah, as she, she was lounge is, is saying on our, our video version here, if you've got someone who's done an amazing unboxing video of the product on YouTube, share that with the customer. This is what it's going to look like when it arrives. This is this is someone else who's already excited about it. Therefore, you should be excited unboxing it. And then, in those um, those um, you know, when you when someone gets the parcel, obviously it's got to be as it should be with the right things in it and so forth. But you also want to make sure there's a bit of excitement in there. Maybe there's um, there's a free gift or there's a note from one of your team saying, thanks so much for buying. Whatever it might be, put something in there just to really lift it. Because one of the things you don't often hear about in e-commerce is that the, the best time to get a second purchase from someone is as soon as they make the first purchase. Right. That's one of the best times. So if you they're testing you out with that first purchase, if the product comes through and it's good and the experience has been good. They are highly likely if you send them an offer soon after that to come back and buy again. So something I would always always advise putting into your parcel is a leaflet or a postcard or something that gives them something off the next purchase, whether it's free returns and free delivery, whether it's 10 percent off or five pounds off or Whatever it may be, it's also a really big opportunity to get the next sale. So you can't, in my opinion, you can't put enough effort and thought into that post-purchase time period because it's a huge opportunity for retaining the customer, for getting a great review, for getting them to tell their friends and for getting that next order as well. Nice, nice, love it. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, reviews. Uh, for example, uh, some marketing books proclaim that you need to uh, launch your product uh, when it's uh, 
not completed version, not good version, because uh, uh, you need to learn customer's feedback and uh, understand how you can improve it. But uh, today, 95% of customers uh, are reading reviews before buying. So they uh, learn reviews and you can get some negative reviews, you know, after the first launch when uh, you can develop and innovate this product. Can you tell how to handle it, uh, how to learn from reviews, how to improve it and uh, what, uh, yeah, uh, how it's important today to, uh, to get reviews from customers? Yeah, I think review content or user-generated content, UGC, whatever you want to call it, is unbelievably useful to the marketer because you can use it across all your marketing channels, okay? We, as human beings, we really respond to social proof. And we increasingly, with the, you know, with the increase of TikTok videos, Facebook videos, and all the rest of it, we increasingly respond to real um, video, real content rather than that which comes from the brand. So if you've got great UGC, great reviews, then you should be using it across all your marketing channels to up the response everywhere. It's also a, a marvelously lazy way of creating content if you can get your customers to do your video marketing for you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about getting negative reviews. Negative reviews are brilliant. Um, there's been research done that even if a, a, a product page with no reviews versus a product page with a one star review. The one star review will sell more product than the page with no reviews. So please don't be scared of the negative reviews. Only be scared of the negative reviews if you're going to ignore them. Okay. Mm -hmm. If someone's put a negative review on the site, respond, explain the problem, say you've, you've taken that on board, suggest another product, offer to do a, do a free refund whatever it might be to help solve their problem and then learn from it. You know, review, like I said, reviews are great for your marketing, but if you're not learning from the reviews, if you're not taking, this is why they love the product, right, let's put that front and center in our marketing. Let's use that to build connection with the customer. Oh, look, we thought that we we're going to use our water bottles to go hiking. They're actually using them for sitting next to the pool. We need to change our marketing messages around that. So take the positives and build on that. Also take the negatives and fix those problems. You know, there's there's no point in continuing to pour water into a bucket that has a big hole that you already know about. Go fix the hole, fix the problem. Um, and because they're a great way to improve, you know, the, the improve the, you know, the performance of your whole business if you actually listen to them. Yeah, yeah. 50% of negative reviews you can replace uh, to uh, positive reviews if you decide the problems of your customers according to a few mm -hmm. studies. So, uh, yeah, I love it. You need to reply to all negative reviews to explain and try to fix if you can. If you can't, then just uh, share uh, your uh, pain that you got this review and yeah, uh, provide some insights how you can decide in the future or uh, provide even free stuff uh, for the future. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> it's up to you. And many uh, restaurants usually do it. They invite to take uh, free dinner or uh, I don't know, or some discounts for parties if uh, their customers got uh, negative experience uh, with their food or something like this. Um, and Shella wanna know more. By the way, I am connected with Shella on LinkedIn. Yeah, she oh. shares a lot of valuable tips. Love it. And uh, please tell about cross-sharing of content on social media apps for different. Yo, there's a big old question. Now, I used to be a massive fan of just repurposing everything everywhere. And I have been convinced that one shouldn't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> so you have to reformat your your social, you know, your, your posts to be correct on the different social platforms, you know. So I use LinkedIn a lot for my business. We use Twitter a bit. We use, we're increasingly using Instagram and trying to get our heads around that. We don't use Facebook very much, but just the hashtags, LinkedIn, use three. Instagram, use loads. Twitter, maybe use one, but maybe not. Um, you know, those are those differences happen there. Instagram, you can't put a link in the post, but you can on stories. So you've got to tweak that. You've got different graphic sizes as well. Then on LinkedIn, uh, we find, we recently found actually putting links in the post creates a better response rate, although slightly less visibility of the post, but then it changes. Twitter, haven't quite yet got to grips with, with whether we should link or not in Twitter, but we are, we get less visibility on there anyway. So, you know, there's a lot of 
uh, of differences you need to take into account across those different channels. Then they start talking about the format and the style of those obviously going to be different on the different channels. One of the one of the most interesting things I've heard, though, is people who are taking or, or getting creators on TikTok, so influencers on TikTok to create videos about their product and then using that on Facebook because response rates to TikTok videos are greater than response rates to Facebook videos. So you can also take content from one and, and use it on another and screen grabs of tweets seem to be appearing a lot on LinkedIn as well at the moment. So what you can't, what I don't think you can do anymore is go into your scheduling tool, create one piece of content and tick Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, wherever else you want to send it. You need to tweak that content to fit correctly into the right spaces, but you're probably going to use a version of the same content everywhere. Pinterest is a world unto itself. Um, sorry, the questions just come in about Pinterest as well. So completely different Pinterest strategy. It's a very intriguing one is Pinterest. Uh, we did a uh, we did a podcast on it not long ago on what's currently working organically on Pinterest. And there's like, I'm going to get the days wrong on this, but there's like a window of time where you really don't want to be sharing the same link more than once. And your graphics really should have the text on them explaining the question. Pinterest is one that works very differently from the rest of them. So you've got to have a different strategy on Pinterest. Um, and that's as far as I'm willing to go on Pinterest, because it's not one I'm doing a lot on at the minute. And I don't want to give you bad advice. Yeah, love it. Uh, you know, um, uh, I remember when uh, in 2019, I decided to extend my business to English speaking countries. Uh, uh, and uh, I tried to be everywhere to repurpose content on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, and I failed to get results. Then I decided to switch my attention to LinkedIn alone. And for example, uh, I got a uh, hundred times more engagement, higher engagement than uh, trying to repurpose content. Uh, I think when you pay attention to one social media, to one channel, you can be better than many others. But when you are trying to cover everything, you know, especially, you know, people, uh, users have different mindsets on different social media. Uh, people are the same, yeah, uh, probably uh, the same people, but they change their mindset, uh, for example, by using Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. So uh, when you uh, submit totally the same content, you can't achieve them, you can't get results. Uh, the, yeah, that's why, uh, for example, I think uh, many uh, are trying to copy Gary Vee, but you know, he has a team and he can uh, repurpose content to convert to uh, according to uh, people's interest. So I think, yeah, uh, it's possible with the right team. But if you have only two hands, as I have, you know, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's the thing about social, isn't it? Everyone's like, oh, social's free. Like social mm -hmm. isn't free. You're putting a huge amount of time in, into it. You should be tracking your time and where you're investing mm -hmm. that time. And, you know, you have to do well on any social platform. You have to do that platform well. So you can either choose to do all of them badly or, or like you said, focus in on one and make that one really spot on. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have the question from Baba Jida. Uh, I'm sorry if I can't pronounce the right your name. Uh, for me, it's hard even to pronounce some American or British names, you know, <laughs> because of my pronunciation. But yeah, uh, the question, which methods are the most effective to communicate with customers? What do you think about that? Well, I think what method you use to communicate with your customers, with your clients, the one that's going to be most efficient is the one that works for your business. You know, mm -hmm. I've in the past, I've worked for mail order companies where catalogs were phenomenal, but not all businesses have the, uh, you know, the resources to create a, a, a paper catalog and you need lists and it's a whole different skill set. Um, then you've got, you know, when I had my marketing agency, that was all predominantly word of mouth or speaking at events. Trade stands didn't really work for us, but I know other businesses who swear by trade stands. I know other businesses who swear by podcast ads or appearing on podcasts. Others where email is key, Facebook ads are key. If you're in the e-commerce space, then you really should be testing Facebook ads, Google ads, including Google Shopping, and probably in Google Discovery as well. And you should be giving, you, you should be really focused in on your email marketing this year, especially. But, you know, 
you've got to test it in your business. Look at what other people in your space are doing and find that and, and don't try and do everything on day one. But yeah, it's going to be a different mix for every business. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, the best way or the best efficient way uh, don't exist because it depends on your audience, on their preferences. Just ask them, you know, uh, for example, some of my customers love to talk on Telegram, others on WhatsApp, the rest uh, are on email. So I just uh, use their loving ways because I can save their time. So uh, why I need to bother them with channels that they don't like. So, yeah. Uh, and that's such an important thing when you're running a smaller business. Why do a channel you don't like? You know, if like, oh, everyone says I should be on TikTok, but I hate it. Well, don't do it then because you're not going to do something you hate well. There's always, you know, now we have we have so many marketing opportunities available to us, so many ways to get in front of our customers and clients. You don't have to do one you hate anymore. You know, go and do one you you find enjoyable. And, you know, if you've if you've got a great background in PR, then go and do that for your business. If you've got a great background in ad platforms, do that. You know, play to your own strengths and what you enjoy is such an important part of making marketing work. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, uh, totally. Uh, you know, uh, from my experience, for example, um, uh, if I uh, dislike some social media, uh, why I need to waste my time? Even, you know, uh, it's interesting that many marketing books uh, share that you need to find where your audience is. Uh, it's the first step. Uh, I disagree with that because if you dislike uh, this social media, you can find your customers on TikTok, you can find on Facebook, you can find on Instagram, but you need to love the social media. You need to enjoy your time because people burn out fast, you know, when they are chasing just uh, metrics, uh, followers, customers, and they when they dislike creating content for uh, choosing social media, it's it's hard to go ahead. You can't overcome your competitors. But uh, you uh, you can find your uh, customers on LinkedIn. You can find on TikTok because uh, just to consider their preferences and create uh, the same content that people want to get. Uh, yeah, personalization. What do you think about personalization? How to personalize, for example, a landing page today? Oh, I just want to add something to what you were just saying because I, okay. I think you're you're completely right that it's not just about where your customers are. It's about where your customers are, where they are when they're thinking about things related to your product and where you can get in front of them at a cost you're willing to pay. Now, that might be a cost of, I hate it, but we get great results, so I'll carry on doing it. It might be the cost of the money it is or the time it is. You know, you've got to, you've got to weigh up all those things to decide where you go. So I think you're absolutely spot on with that. Um, as to personalization, I think personalization is something that's well worth investing in at the moment. I mentioned quizzes earlier. You know, they are a way for you to gather data the customer is willing to give you about their preferences, maybe about their hair color, their dog type, where they take their water bottles. Um, and then you can use that to personalize their communications. You can also use the other data you collect, you know, products they've looked at and so forth. And it's such a, you know, Consumers give us this data because they expect us to do something with it and they want us to give them a better experience because of it. So it really is in our interest to personalize um, those communications. You mentioned about personalizing your LinkedIn page, I think. Um, <laughs> I have to say, well, I don't do any, I don't think I do any personalization on my LinkedIn page. So I'm not quite sure what to, what to suggest there, but I would, if you can personalize for your customer base, I would definitely do it. So, but I'm not quite sure yeah. on the LinkedIn front. It's possible. It's possible in the, you know, uh, in the section bio, uh, you can uh, add the right message. You know, for example, friendly style, considering your uh, uh, customers or visitors or official style. Uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, for example, I usually use friendly style, you know, in most cases. Uh, and uh, what about LinkedIn pages? For example, when you uh, sell customers, uh, they open your landing page. Uh, can you provide some insights how to personalize it? Uh, because, you know, if customers open landing page and uh, don't uh, buy, don't convert. So, uh, yeah, I think you, you can lose money with that. Uh, what do you think about personalization with landing pages? Um, I think I think it's really important to have a LinkedIn page for a business now. I think think 
it seems to me like the LinkedIn algorithm is giving them more visibility than they used to. So, you know, I've been a bit skeptical and we just kind of mm -hmm. had them as placeholders in the past, you know, just so we had the right URLs, <laughs> and the right brand uh -huh. names. Now we started putting more, more <laughs> effort into tailoring the com content that we're putting out via them to be relevant to that particular voice. Cause we have, we have one for each podcast. Um, and then we have another one for the book that we don't use very often, but you know, we do have mm -hmm. one for each podcast. So we tailor that messages to each of those. Um, we're actively trying to build our audience on there by using the invite stat and seeing, you know, there's that, there's that caveat between asking the perfect listener in our case to sign up and then asking people, you know, have got big followings. So we kind of deviate between the two to grow the list on there and then make sure the content's right. I think, you know, one of the key key things I keep seeing with LinkedIn pages at the moment is that a lot of businesses have very dodgy LinkedIn pages. Uh -huh. Link to website doesn't work. Uh, the wrong um, employees listed there, the wrong information. So I guess first and foremost, I make sure it's actually up to date and make sure the content on there is accurate. Then I go about mm -hmm. growing the, uh, the number of people um, who are following that page. And then I'd look at upping the quality of the content um, to, to do to do it with that um, and trying to get people to refer to that LinkedIn page when they're posting about you and not just as you as a person, because that obviously gives you more more visibility as well. Those are the things I'm actively doing with our LinkedIn pages at the moment. Yeah, yeah, nice. Uh, okay, uh, it's a big pleasure, you know, to get you on my show, to learn from you. Uh, you share a lot of valuable insights. It will be great if you can uh, send me links to all these books. Yeah, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll share them in the description below. Uh, tell our audience how they can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Sure. So um, I'm Chloe Thomas, host of two podcasts in the e-commerce space, uh, e-commerce master plan, where we release a interview with a different retailer every Monday, which these days are as much about the journey to uh, net zero in the world of carbon and sustainability as they are in terms of e-commerce success. But some amazing case studies we've been putting out recently. So that's every Monday, the e-commerce master plan podcast. And then the other podcast is called the Keep Optimizing podcast, where each month we do a masterclass on a different uh, marketing method. And within that, each week, I interview a different expert on that. So last month was email, this month is SEO. Um, and, and I learn a lot in those episodes in particular. So um, I think our audience do too. And you can find how to get in contact with me and everything we do at ecommercemasterplan.com. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, guys, it's must have, you know, if you want to learn, if you want to sell more, <laughs> then connect with uh, on social media, uh, learn more, uh, learn from this podcast. It's a big pleasure to have you on my show to learn from you uh, to get all these valuable insights. Uh, and guys, listen us on Apple, Google, Spotify, find all dimensional links in the description below and see you next time.